Men have always tried to encode secrets. Military communication. Love letters. Forbidden knowledge. And most secret text is eventually decoded. But among all of history's cryptic writings, one stands out. It's the world's most mysterious book, written by an unknown author in an odd alphabet, and brilliantly illustrated with puzzling images. For centuries, it defies all attempts to unveil its secrets. Now, for the first time, Experts analyze the ink, pigments, and parchment of the Voynich Manuscript. What secrets are hidden between these lines? Who wrote them? And why? At the headquarters of the U.S. Military Intelligence Service, these experts succeeded in decoding Japan's so-called Purple Code. William Frederick Friedman, the service's director, is one of the world's best cryptographers. For practice between jobs, Friedman and his team decode ancient cryptic texts. One by one, the codes are cracked. But one book, the Voynich Manuscript, stubbornly defies all attempts to decode it. Unnerved, the cryptographers give up. It's the only code they're unable to crack. The roughly 200-page manuscript with its strange symbols has been a mystery for decades. At the beginning of the 20th century, an antiques dealer from New York visits Villa Mondragone near Rome looking for precious books. His name is Wilfried Voynich. Villa Mondragone is home to many historical texts from a Jesuit school. Wilfried Voynich is allowed to inspect a trunk that comes from the estate of Athanasius Kircher, one of the most famous scholars of the 17th century. Among various manuscripts, the trunk contains an unusual book. Voynich buys the manuscript and, for the rest of his life, tries to decipher it. He dies without even coming close to a solution. After Voynich's death, the manuscript ends up at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale. The library possesses a wealth of literary gems, but probably none as famous as the Voynich Manuscript. René Zandbergen is one of the leading experts on the Voynich Manuscript and has been working on it for years. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can I help? I have come to see the Voynich manuscript. Okay, put you for I have. When I first saw an image of a page of the Voynich manuscript, I immediately had the feeling, this is something that I can decipher, this is something I can read. But 
as the years went by, this turned out to be wrong. So I couldn't read it like so many other people before me. Thank you, Library Officer Rosemont. How may I help? Stand by transferring. The manuscript is kept in a secure place at the Beinecke Library. For the first time, René Zandbergen is able to inspect the original. And the really amazing thing is that somebody probably wrote something many hundreds of years ago, and still with modern technology, we still cannot decipher this. On more than 200 pages of parchment, a million graphic details and some 170,000 characters unfold. It's beautiful. In this tangle of text and images, an expert's eye can easily get lost. Let's see a few of the astrological things. And then there were the drawings of the strange nymphs. Yes. Yeah. The other interesting thing about the manuscript is it allows for so many different interpretations. There are so many drawings, so many figures. You can think of, of any theory, and you will find evidence in the manuscript that fits this. This is really amazing. On closer inspection, the manuscript appears to be less confusing. The drawings break down the book into separate sections. Conservator Paula Zayats has spent hours studying the manuscript. Now we can't read the text, but we can guess probably what the book is about from the illustrations. So. It seems to consist of several sections. I'd say the greater preponderance of text in, the, in this book has to do with um, botanicals, herbals. It's clearly a book about these plants. It shows their root systems, their leaves, their flowers. Some of the drawings even seem to be inspired by reality. I would assume that what it says probably talks about where you're going to find this plant, how it grows, and then what can you use it for. Medicine was based on herbs. So another big part of medicine at that time is also included in the book. It's zodiac charts, star charts, you know, the sky. But even here, there are astonishing parallels to natural shapes. Some of the book's pages also contain optical phenomena. If set into a spinning motion, these illustrations come to life. What does this combination of plants and astronomical symbols mean? In the Middle Ages, if you were to be treated herbally, you had to know what your zodiac sign was. And then there's the, the ladies. They start a little later on. Ladies tumbling through pools of green water. These bathing scenes are particularly puzzling. Does it hint at a collection of recipes for a bathing cure? Or even of the secret of the fountain of youth? Other illustrations seem to support this view. And then it's followed by this section Towards the end, I guess it looks like recipes, um, where things look as though this is how you need to cut up your herbs that you've just seen on the preceding pages, and this is what you need to cook them in, perhaps, or pound them with. So I don't know. I mean, just to someone who knows nothing at all, it sure looks like an herbal, a medical book. Was the author a medical genius hiding his discoveries from competitors?
from the Holy Inquisition, which often roots out new knowledge. Wilfried Wojnicz himself discovers the first clue leading to the anonymous author. While making reprographs of the original Voynich manuscript, an item once invisible accidentally appears. Someone has written something on the first page. The words were scratched from the parchment, but under ultraviolet light, traces of ink become visible. It's very faint, but I can see a T. T starting to dip in its... Something underneath. Jacobus at tip in its... It's fairly clear. Jakobus Atepinich is a traveling doctor and expert in medical plants in the 17th century. His preparations are famous far and wide. In 1608, he is summoned to Prague by Emperor Rudolf II. The emperor suffers from depression and melancholia. Tepanich's famous herbal extracts will hopefully relieve the monarch's distress. Tepanich experiments with herbs. He grows them, distills extracts, mixes them with alcohol, and makes a fortune. His alcoholic remedies seem to inspire the emperor's well-being. To thank Tepanich, the emperor promotes him, appointing him imperial chief distiller. But why would a doctor encode his recipes? Groups who were involved in the practice of healing could easily get themselves in trouble with, with the church and with authorities. Kevin Rep is the curator of the Beinecke Library's manuscript collection. Alchemy was um, very closely related to the growth of science in the early modern period. And yet at the same time, alchemy was considered to be an extremely arcane topic, meaning the information that was recorded in these texts was often considered to be extremely secret. Did Jacobus Satepanich create the world's most mysterious manuscript? Most of the plant illustrations are unlike any natural plant. Details are out of proportion or reminiscent of parts of the human anatomy or of abstract symbols. They are allegorical images rather than botanical illustrations. This type of plant representation dates back to the Middle Ages. The medieval tradition was not to represent them realistically or naturalistically, but rather to represent them in terms of the powers that these particular plants possess. However, in the early 17th century, illustrations of plants are depicted in a more realistic manner. If we're talking about a book that was written in the 16th or 17th century, you would expect it to be much more similar to a book like this. This book is from 1562, and as you can see, there's a much greater emphasis made on precision. You can identify these plants.
Such aspects of art history are not considered during Tepanich's time. He only works in a style he's familiar with. Even though his name is found on the first page, it's unlikely that he is the author. Other books from his estate bear almost identical signatures. Clearly, at some point, the Voynich manuscript was in his possession. But the manuscript is written at an earlier time. A clue to the Voynich manuscript's age is discovered with the book. This is a very important letter. It was written in 1665 by the Bohemian doctor Johannes Marcus Marzi. He is sending it to his good friend Athanasius Kirchi in Rome, who was a universal scientist and believed to be able to understand all languages in the world. Marzi sends him the book in order to have it translated. The interesting thing is that in this letter we also learn a bit more about the past of the manuscript. Marzi heard from a friend that it was once bought by the Bohemian Emperor Rudolf II of Habsburg for the sum of 600 ducats. Emperor Rudolf II is known for sponsoring the sciences. But back then, no distinction is made between natural science and magic. Rudolf has a huge collection of occult books and magical instruments. He spends huge amounts of money for his collection, which also includes the Voynich manuscript. When Rudolf dies, he leaves behind a great deal of debt. Jakobus Satepanich is probably one of his creditors. He must have been compensated with objects from the emperor's library. This is how the Voynich manuscript probably came into his possession. The letter to the universal genius Athanasius Kircher also hints at the manuscript's origin. The letter even names the book's author, Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon is a famous English clergyman in the 13th century with a telling nickname, Dr. Mirabilis, the Miracle Doctor. Bacon's insights greatly exceed his contemporaries. His urge for new discoveries frequently causes conflict with the church. He is imprisoned at various times. He is one of the first Europeans interested in optical phenomena and worked with magnifying glasses. Many drawings in the astrological section of the Voynich manuscript resemble shapes that are only seen through a microscope. Is this the very first glimpse into a previously hidden world? At the time of Roger Bacon, the microscopes did not exist that could make the type of detailed observations that are seen in the Voynich manuscript. It wasn't until the early 17th century when Cornelius Drebbel developed a complex, sophisticated uh, twin convex lens microscope where we, where we would be able to see the types of things which seem to be reflected in, in these images. In fact, most of the illustrations appear detached from conditions of reality.
Do they reflect a longing for a place of fantasy? A place that 17th century minds imagine somewhere in the deep past. Well, at the time that Cornelius Strebel was in London, there was a tremendous interest in the idea of the ancient book of mysterious knowledge. If anyone were to create such um, a book as the Voynich, they would have ended up with a very valuable document that would have garnered them great prestige and possibly um, been able to sell for a great deal of money. So, perhaps the Voynich manuscript is a purely decorative object, a perfectly created illustration of a mysterious ancient book. Even today, looking through a microscope opens up new perspectives. The surface of the parchment is very smooth and undisturbed. I don't see any abrasion. I don't even see any corrections. In other words, 200 pages of text have been written without even a slight error. An almost superhuman feat. This raises suspicions. There's only one source of information about the discovery of the manuscript. Wilfried Voynich himself. Perhaps this successful dealer in antique books could not resist the temptation of fabricating such an odd and extremely precious book. Several people suspect that Voynich is a fraud. Very white page. It's all the different signs of the zodiac. Meanwhile, modern material science has the tools to find out. Microscopy expert Joseph Barabe will investigate the manuscript. He and his team have exposed numerous forgeries. Well, the first thing we'll do is look at it and uh, uh, see if any of the working methods are inappropriate for the time period. But mostly we would be looking at the materials. So let's look for a page with some good pigments. Okay. We have many choices here. They're all looking pretty good. Through the microscope, the manuscript's hidden beauty is revealed. This fantastic micro world harbors information that can prove whether the book is genuine or a hoax. I'll be taking uh, a group of small samples and the analytical methods that we use then uh, range from light microscopy which gives us a look at just what it looks like and we do elemental analysis on the particles and that tells us what it consists of. We also look at the chemistry using spectrographic methods and crystallographic methods and that gives us a picture of what it is. Basically what we're trying to determine during our examination is how the object was constructed because if it's a forgery most forgers will make stupid mistakes. Okay. But we get it from these ridges at the top. Very good. Joseph Barabe samples paint and ink from various portions of the manuscript. So what we found was that the ink is in iron gall ink and we found that it was made in several different batches because the constituents vary somewhat uh, from batch to batch. The blue is azurite, ground azurite, a very beautiful mineral pigment. Uh, the red is a, the red and the brown are iron earth pigments, uh, red ochre with hematite, uh, wonderful stuff. So in summary what we found was that the materials uh, that constitute the writing and the painting of this document are completely appropriate to the 15th and 16th centuries. And more importantly, we did not find any materials that would indicate that it was a 19th or 20th century forgery. The paints and inks are proof that the Voynich manuscript is authentic. To get the bright hues present in the Voynich manuscript, the colors are applied with great care by a skilled artist.
In stark contrast, however, many of the drawings appear sloppy, even naive. Many figures in the manuscript, such as this little dragon or the red-cheeked woman, seem to be creations of an infant's hand. The first picture I ever saw of the manuscript was this one, and I assumed or developed the hypothesis that it was written by a young Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo is a gifted child growing up in a wealthy family. From his early youth, he must have learned how to use a brush and pen. Does the Voynich manuscript contain his first illustrations? If you look at the quality of the drawing, and the quality of the drawing and the other pictures, you realize that they are not very sophisticated, and it was probably one of his first books done when he was a child. One page in particular hints at da Vinci. I saw this astrological picture which shows uh, 15 little nude ladies sitting in tubs, uh, some of them fairly obviously pregnant, and a ram representing the astrological symbol Aries. The Aries symbol could stand for the month of April. The Aries is surrounded by 15 obviously pregnant women. If each woman represents one day, the illustration could signify April 15th, Da Vinci's birthday. Was the Voynich manuscript an early example of the coded text he would later produce? Leonardo was a genius, one of the greatest artists in history. Even at an early age, he is an expert draftsman. The drawings in the Voynich manuscript, however, show no sign of early genius. And there's reason to believe that this was not the product of a child. This book might have been a very expensive book. The pigments, particularly the, min the mineral pigments that are used throughout, are of very good quality, uh, especially as evidenced by the fact that we can still see them bright and clear. Parchment gets more expensive the larger the sheet. And this book contains a number of foldouts, including a full page foldout, uh, which, I, which is pretty unusual. When you start moving into parchment that are this size and larger, it has to be taken from the center of a piece of skin. That alone costs money. So you had to have someone with the means to obtain a fair quantity of good quality parchment, good quality pigments, and the amount of time that it would take to do this, it really could be a couple of years um, worth of work. Apparently, the unknown author invested years of his life in a book which must have cost a fortune to produce. The information within must have been of great value. So great, in fact, that it had to be encoded. There have been several methods for encoding text throughout history. The Caesar Code, originally used by Julius Caesar, was popular throughout the Middle Ages. A shift code, wherein the alphabet is simply shifted forward by four digits, so that A becomes D, B becomes E, etc. Easy to use and equally easy to crack. The Caesar code is the simplest method. A decoder must determine by how many letters the alphabet is shifted. To crack it, it takes a maximum of 25 attempts. Sicher war sie bestimmt nicht, deswegen schon um 1330 
It was by no means safe. So around 1330, the papal court tried to create a code book wherein strategic keywords like Pope, Church or King were replaced by single characters. To decipher a message, the receiver needs to have a list of the code words. This method results in ever-growing code lists that are tedious to update. And it is difficult to securely transfer these lists from the sender to the receiver. The cipher disk is more efficient and easier to handle. Several revolving rings with characters enable the user to create more complex codes. The cipher square is developed in the late 16th century. From a modern perspective, all of these methods are simplistic. Today, with enhanced frequency analysis and computer-assisted decoding methods, we can easily crack coded texts up to the 17th, even the 18th century. For this, we need a critical mass. 30 characters are not sufficient. Given that, and given that the plain text made sense, any coded text from that period can be deciphered. So, does this profusion of characters represent a text that makes sense? To find out, all 170,000 characters of the manuscript are electronically evaluated. The distribution pattern of each character is then compared to known patterns of natural languages. The result. Some characters occur more often than others. Like, for instance, particular vowels in European languages. However, most elements of the Voynich text do not correspond to the phonetic patterns of any natural language. In spite of all the modern technical tools that have been applied, the mysterious manuscript is still a mystery. The code remains uncracked. For me, the fact that it's still not been cracked by modern cryptographic techniques makes it highly unlikely that there's any real cipher in there. So, the Voynich manuscript may not even be an encoded message. The distribution patterns point to a different theory. Some of the features of the manuscript were very unusual in terms of human languages but were exactly the things you'd expect if somebody was producing something artificially and trying to make it look like a language. Gordon Rugg thinks the unknown author merely wanted to create an impression that the book contained something mysterious. For this purpose, he may have used historical codes. One simple method is to use a thing called a card and grill. The key concept is you have the grill, which is a piece of card with holes cut in it in a particular pattern. In the cryptographic version, you put it over a text and it reveals the hidden message through the holes. But you can also use it to generate meaningless text by putting it over the table, reading out the word which is revealed through the holes, writing it down, moving it across, generating another word, writing that down, moving it across, and so on to the end of the grill, and then repeating the process. So, using that method, you could generate text very swiftly and very efficiently, as fast as you could write it down. This would explain why the world's best cryptographers have failed to find a message. But who would produce such a book? 
The most likely suspect is an Elizabethan adventurer called Edward Kelly. Edward Kelly originally comes from England. He is the town scribe, but is fired for forging official documents. Allegedly, his ear is cut off for punishment. A fact he hides for the rest of his life with hairstyles and hats. Kelly leaves England by the late 16th century and travels the cities of Europe, pretending to be a scholar. As for why he might have done it, there are several possible explanations. One possible explanation is simply money. The Voynich manuscript was bought by Emperor Rudolf II for a very large amount of money. So if you could produce a manuscript that size, quickly and efficiently, you could make a large amount of profit by selling it to Rudolf. Rudolf II has numerous scientists on his payroll, including crackpots, dazzlers and imposters. Kelly may have seen his chance and offers his services to the Emperor. He was an alchemist who claimed to have been able to produce gold from ordinary materials. Kelly claims to be able to make gold with the help of his apparatuses. To check his ability, Emperor Rudolf has Kelly's tools inspected in the alchemist locked in a room. Edward Kelly knows that he is under observation. Of course, his mysterious alchemistic experiments never really produce gold. Nor was it necessary, because Kelly smuggles a tiny nugget into the room. The Emperor is obviously impressed. Kelly is hired. But there's other possible motivations as well as money. That somebody believed that the angels were talking to them, for example, to spell out some mystical words. <laughs> Kelly is experienced with such phenomena. On behalf of another Englishman, the mathematician John Dee, he contacts angels for some time. Of course, Kelly is the only person on earth who knows the language of the angels and is able to dictate their words to a thrilled John Dee. Kelly uses special characters which he reads from a magic table. The angelic language, of course, is pure fantasy. Allegedly, their collaboration abruptly ends when the angels tell Kelly that he and Dee are to swap wives. In Kelly's case, he had the means, the motive, the opportunity, and the personality to hoax it. Many things point to Edward Kelly as the author of the Voynich Manuscript. He previously invents a fantasy language. And Emperor Rudolf II is a financially potent and gullible buyer of his mysterious writings and formulas. Today, for the first time, we can convict the 16th century dazzler by using modern technology. Greg Hodgins of the University of Arizona will take several samples of the Voynich manuscript. The manuscript is written on animal skin, so its age can be precisely determined. Like any organic material, parchment can be dated by the radiocarbon method.
The book has never been scrutinized in this way. Since relatively large samples are needed, the radiocarbon test had previously been rejected. But now, for the first time ever, it is possible to determine exactly how old this mysterious manuscript really is. To ensure accuracy, Greg Hodgins takes four samples from four different pages. A few weeks later, the lab results arrive with a big surprise. So there are the four measurements from the four samples that we took from the Voynich manuscript. And as you can see, the dates are very tightly clustered together. It gives a picture of it being created in a relatively short period of time. Moreover, because they're so tightly clustered together, it means we can treat it as one object that's been dated four times, and that increases the precision of the measurement. So at 95% confidence, we can say the age of the Voynich manuscript is 1404 AD to 1438 AD. This result is extraordinary and overthrows all the previous assumptions about the manuscript's origin. Neither Tepanich nor Roger Bacon could have been the authors. Leonardo da Vinci also was born half a century later. Even Edward Kelly now has a sound alibi. He lived one and a half centuries later. None of the existing theories assumed the early 15th century to be the period of the manuscript's creation. All relevant methods of examination available today have been applied to the Voynich manuscript. It was written around 1420. With this new information, one detail in the manuscript gets a new meaning. On more than 200 pages filled with fantastic sceneries, there is only one realistic representation of a city. One with towers, walls, and turrets. The ramparts are drawn with so-called swallowtail battlements. In combination with the manuscript's date of origin, these turrets take on a special significance. Later in history, swallowtail turrets are common across Europe. But in the early 15th century, they only exist in northern Italy. During the Renaissance period, Northern Italy is one of the wealthiest and most influential regions of the Western world. This is the historical background of the manuscript's creation. Up to now, the research about the Voynich manuscript lacked a historical anchoring point. No one knew in which period or region a search could be started. Now, this has changed. We know where to look. It will be exciting to see what further references to the mysterious manuscript will be found in the archives between Milan and Venice. Dating the book is a major step toward increasing our chances to one day understand the Voynich manuscript. For the time being, the Voynich manuscript remains what it has been for the last 600 years. It's a hall of mirrors reflecting each researcher's own imagination without ever allowing him a glimpse into its inner secrets.